everyone, I'm Dr. Duke. Welcome to part three of the socialist destruction of education. Today we're going to be talking about the antidote. What is the antidote to the poison of socialism? What do socialists themselves fear most? What bothers socialists so much that they have to co-opt it to their own way of thinking? And what is the single best way to educate your ch ch children in a way that makes them, in many respects, socialism proof. There's a reason why modern historians go out of their way, modern secular university socialist historians, go out of their way to pretend that the founding fathers were not Christians, that Christianity had no role to play in the founding of this country, that uh, the Judeo-Christian worldview going back 2,000 years was not the moral underpinning of the Constitution and the foundation of American values. They pretend that because they know that re in reality it is socialism that is destroyed by Christianity. And why? What is it about Christianity? Even if you don't believe in the theology of Christianity, what is there about the history, educational Christianity, that is such witch's bane when it comes to socialism? And the answer is the individual. There is no figure in human history, none, zero, zip, nada. There is no figure in human history who was a more passionate and sacrificial devotee of the individual than Jesus Christ. If you go back and read the Gospels, you will find in it the greatest defender of individuality the world has ever seen. Christ's ministry was preached individually to people. Yes, he lectured people, he taught in parables to large groups, but his healing, his ministry, and ultimately the faith predicated on his way of life, his sacrificial death, is based on individual choice. It's not based on the collective. The collective can't decide who Jesus is. The individual has, has to. Jesus requires of those he heals. To, to answer one question, do you think I can do this? Who do you say that I am? Everything about the Gospels, and, and, and you think about the evolution of Christianity for 2,000 years, at least until the 18th century when we got the foundation of America, from the death of Christ to the time of the Founding Fathers, Christianity continued to evolve along individualistic lines. That's why Western culture, more than anything else, the life and death of Christ, the, the institutionalization of Christianity is the reason that over 1800 years, Christianity became more and more individual focused, right? You couldn't have had the founding of America without the individualistic ideas of Christ, which were woven in to a kind of new form of government where politicians worked for people. A very liberty-minded, independent, everybody is responsible for themselves sort of country that flows ultimately from the ideological and philosophical development of Christianity. In fact, I want to take you back, if I may, to the Gospels themselves to make this point directly. I believe that in the temptation of Christ, this is a story that appears in uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 and the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. This is the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, where after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, he came up out of the water, he heard the, the Holy Spirit descended, we hear the words, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, and then in the Gospels you get this really odd, for the Gospels anyway, almost metaphysical uh, uh, pause. You think about, you read the Gospels, they're, they're really, even the miracles, they're very prosaic. They're written in very accessible language. There's nothing hyper-mythological about them. They are really, the, the narratives are very realistic in terms, the Gospels are very realistic in terms of how they're related. But there is this one place in the Gospels where Jesus is whisked into the wilderness. And for 40 days and 40 nights, we're told that he fasted and he was weak, weak to the point of exhaustion and collapse. And at that point, the devil visited him. And you see right here, Satan visits Christ in the wilderness. It's, it, it moves us out of the very real human world of the Gospels and places us in an almost mythological background to make a very important point. And I think the three temptations of Christ in the wilderness lay out for us not only the individuality of Christ and his commitment to it, but also the antidote for what would evolve to become socialism. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, Jesus said, uh, the, Satan said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. This is a remarkable temptation. There's Christ. He is the son of God. He is suffering. He is his physical body, which he has inhabited, is he's become one with, is hungry to the point of exhaustion and collapse. And the devil picks the weakest time, the time that Christ is most vulnerable. And he tempts him in a very clever way. The devil doesn't bring bread to Jesus, right? Because it would be very difficult to accept that. 
But the devil simply stands beside and says, look, if you are the son of God, that predicate, right? Just command these stones to become bread. Look, your father made food and your father made bellies. The eating can't be bad for humans, the devil says. And I won't even be involved. If you are the son of God, the devil says, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is a damning, chilling indictment of materialism. We've said in the previous two lessons that socialism is ultimately a materialist philosophy. It doesn't believe in God or transcendence. It doesn't believe in heaven or hell. It believes that human beings are just highly evolved animals milling around with other animals, that morality is a social construct, that there is no absolute truth that underpins any human behavior, which is why socialism, one reason why socialism is so quick to become violent and genocidal, because there's no innate resp respect for human life. There's no idea that human life is of a higher order than simply animal life. Are we allowed to kill others for our own personal comfort? Is personal comfort, even to the point of survival, food, air, water, shelter, are these things to take precedence over our moral obligation, not just to God, but to each other? Christ is absolutely rejecting this in devastating fashion. If you're the son of God, the devil says, then make these stones bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There are higher things than even our body survival. If you're a materialist socialist, there's only this world, right? There's only what we have here. Four walls, five senses, three dimensions. And when you die like every other animal, you rot and turn to dust and everything that you were goes away. That's the, the philosophical spine of socialism. Is it any wonder that it's materialistic? Is it any wonder that it's driven by jungle power politics? Is it any wonder that abortion and euthanasia and genocide uh, re and concentration camps and the iron boot of despotism are part of the socialist way, believing as they do only in materialism? And a hungry, starving Christ rejects that, rejects that worldview. There are higher things higher things of faith and imagination and love and sacrifice and mercy that we don't see in socialist governments. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, took him to the top of the temple and set him there. And the devil said unto him, if you be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt da dash thy foot against a stone. Uh, the, this is a temptation of temptation, right? Show us. This is empiricism. What guides the materialist-minded person? What is the only thing the socialist, the materialist, the atheist, the person trapped in material reality who believes nothing beyond it? What's the one thing they put their hat, they hang their hat on? It's empiricism, right? If it can't be proven in the physiological world, it's not true. So in other words, unless we can take a 50-foot tall Q-tip, swab a cloud, and grow God spores in a Petri dish, well, then obviously God doesn't exist. There is nothing transcendent. We look to the animal. We look to nature and materialism now for the way we should behave as human beings. We don't look to God and the angels for a higher level of being. This is the temptation to empiricism, the un, one of the undergirding philosophical precepts, scientific precepts that underpins materialism. And Jesus rejects that too. Jesus is an anti-science clearly, but he's simply pointing out like bread is not enough for man's spiritual development. So too empirical proof is not enough for a material creature that has a soul. So the devil took him up to this holy city, put him at the top of the tower and said, go ahead and throw yourself down. It's written in your own scriptures in the Old Testament. It is written that God will give his angels charge over you and they will not let you dash your foot against a stone. But Jesus rejected the empirical ploy, right? He rejected the idea that God could be reduced to material proof. Jesus replied to the devil, it is written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You will not do it, right? Faith is by definition free will, free conscience. To be able to believe in something that cannot be verified by your sensory animal being is the cost of faith. If God made himself scientifically available, if he let us swab his cheek, if we had God DNA, if we could clone some weird Dan Brown anti-Christian fantasy, if we could clone little Jesuses and have them running around, then it would be almost impossible not to believe in God. 
And so there goes free will and free conscience. Christ will, his respect for the individual is such that he, is, he will never enslave the conscience as socialism seeks to do. He will never override human choice and conscience the way the social materialist seeks to do so. And it does so by using education on little kids. Go to the final temptation, which I think in some ways is the most damning. Again, the devil took Jesus up, to the, up into an exceedingly high mountain and the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of them. In other words, to whom does this belong? Worldly wealth, materialism, uh, prosperity, power, ambition, lust, these kind of things that earthbound people pursue because they are the pinnacle of life as an animal. Every animal seeks to live as long as it can and to be as comfortable as it can. These are the only two biological aims of biological life. And here you have an argument where the devil himself, these things belong to him. Again, the devil took Jesus up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And the devil said unto Jesus, all these things I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Two things, right? We know that world, flesh, and the devil, according to Christ, are the three things that takes a man's soul. What are the three things that destroy a human being made in the image of God? Not the materialist, animalistic creature that the socialist imagines. What destroys a person's soul? Well, there's the world, worldliness and materialism. That is the foundation of socialism. Worldliness and materialism, flesh, uh, 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 believing that only the body matters, that making the body happy, that seeing to the body's mortal needs, right? This is all that matters. Think about what the socialism wants, the socialist wants. Doesn't want e e prosperity for everybody. He wants everybody to have minimum things, right? Everybody should have what the animal needs, but no one should have any more than that. So every animal, every human animal for the socialists, that's why it's all about money and giving people other people's stuff, right? The socialist animal must all have the same kind of housing, the same kind of food, the same kind of uh, basic needs met, Now, including healthcare. Now, you're not gonna give people really good healthcare or really good food, they're not gonna have really good lodgings, everyone's gonna have a minimal level, right? And that's what the materialist does. These things, so you got world, flesh, and then the devil's the third. And so the devil's in control of the material world. It's a remarkable statement. But Jesus responded to the devil, Get thee hence, Satan, be gone, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. All right? That to be a human being is not to be a slave to the world. Power, lust, greed, these things are sins in the Christian hierarchy. They are not simply just bad economic behavior as identified by a socialist. These are actually damnable sins. The idea that the world is an adjunct of materialism and worldliness and materialism are both adjuncts of Satanism. It's a remarkable statement. Think about the best the socialist can do. The best the socialist can do is move around material goods, right? It's not a moral philosophy. It's not a spiritual philosophy. It's not a philosophy of mercy or justice. It's simply reorganizing who has stuff, right? It's simply, again, a weak economic system that's been proven, going all the way back to Marx, to be miserable. It, it promotes miserable, miserableness equally is all it does. And here you have Christ who definitively rejects this temptation. The world is not the answer. That doesn't mean that we don't eat. After uh, the angels left here, we find out what? The devil leaved, left Christ, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. It's not that eating or surviving or, or t t realizing that we are partially biological creatures who need nourishment, that's not the issue. The issue is, is that do you live for material reality or do you live for the reality beyond the material? And this is a critical thing because there's no real collective salvation here. It depends on what your soul is doing, depends upon what you have chosen, depending upon whether or not you have chosen Christ as your savior. Uh, your church can't choose him for you. Your community, your nation, your, the United Nations can't choose your salvation for you. It has to be an individual thing. But with socialist governments, materialist socialist governments, they make every choice for you. In fact, the socialist material, materialist governments seek to take away both choice and conscience from the individual. 
That's the devastating thing in education. That's the kind of system we're teaching to our kids. Entitlement, not gratitude. Worldliness, not spiritualism. The idea that there, is, there are realities and truths, particularly moral truths, that supersede biological realities. We've, for two generations now, been giving kids this utterly secular ed education, and we see them to grow up to be intellectually igno ignorant, collectivists in their politics, anti-American, anti-free markets. One of the most acute observers of this phenomenon was the great Russian Christian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky died in 1881, and he was a good 30 years before the socialist communist revolution took place in Russia. And yet he was one of the great observers. He knew, he absolutely knew Dostoevsky where this socialist communism was going and how the only really react, the only way to react to it, the only way to defend against it was going to be Christianity. He predicted that when the Bolsheviks would take power, the churches would have to go underground. They wouldn't go away, and they didn't. They would just have to go underground. Here is a, a, a letter in 1880, a year before he died, that Dostoevsky wrote to the Moscow Herald newspaper about socialists. It goes like this. The modern negationist, the modern socialist, the modern unbeliever in transcendence, the modern negationist declares himself openly in favor of the devil's advice and main, the devil, as we just saw it in the three temptations of Christ, right? Choose the world, not God. Choose bread, not truth. The modern negationist declares himself openly in favor of the devil's advice and maintains that it is more likely to result in man's happiness than the teaching of Christ. See, Christ said, live for others here, not for self. Live for soul here, not biology. Live for spirit not for world and materialism. The devil said it's exactly the opposite. Be the animal that you are. Be, let biology be your guide. Let the pursuit of comfort and survival be your only mission. Dostoevsky's right. The modern socialist declares himself openly in favor of the devil's advice, not Jesus's advice, and maintains that it is more likely worldliness, materialism, to result in man's happiness than the teachings of Christ. To our foolish but terrible Russian socialism, for our children are mixed up in it. And Dostoevsky recognized that. Even in 1880, the nascent socialist movement was fixating on children, convincing kids they are ch animals, not really people with souls. Why are we sexualizing little kids? This is your answer. Because it's one way to tie children in a socialist manner to their bodies, to the baser forms of sex. Sex is not marriage and commitment. Sex is not the consummation of a religiously ordained wedding. Sex is not something that has a holy connotation. No, 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 no. Sex, another biological function like blowing your nose uh, or burping. It has no other real significance. Teach little children to be sexual children, and you have broken down at very young ages what would have otherwise been things like modesty and humility and decency and communality with the person that you love. All that's broken apart here and they're turned into materialists with regards to sex. That's why they're doing it if you haven't been able to figure it out. It's an adjunct of making student, uh, young children materialists and biological secularists. He says, to our foolish but terrible Russian socialism, for our children are mixed up in it, it is a, ba it is a directive and it seems a very powerful one. The loaves of bread, the Tower of Babel, that is the future reign of socialism and the complete enslavement of the freedom of conscience. That is what the desperate socialist is striving to achieve. The ultimate enslavement of human conscience. No more individuality, taking away the burden of choice and therefore the burden of guilt and responsibility away from people. That's what socialism really is. It allows people to default to the collective. Just in the same way that People who would never themselves be violent as individuals or antisocial, put a bunch of people like that in a mob and watch how quickly they give up their scruples and their, and their, uh, their moral principles to behave the way the mob does. That's exactly what happens with socialism. To a T, that's what happens with socialism. By being part of the collective, you give up your responsibility. You no longer have to worry about your own conscience. The collective can deal with that. The collective must know what it's dealing. You become part of a greater materialistic body like that, then suddenly things 
like genocide. What, what happened in Hitler's Germany or what the Bolsheviks did to Eastern Europeans and Jews. Those kind of things, right, become acceptable because you're not responsible for me. It's the collective conscience that did those things. How many times did we hear it at the Nuremberg trials, right? I was just following orders. Can't blame me, blame the orders, right? This is the sacrifice of conscience because conscience is the one thing in the human animal that allows it to feel guilt. And according to the materialist socialist, guilt is not something we should feel. It's unhealthy. And I love what Dostoevsky says here. He calls the Tower of Babel, the two things, the two stories in the Bible, he says, reminded us of, of socialism. One was the loaves and the bread, what we just saw, the idea here of, of Christ being fed in the wilderness, Christ feeding other people, that and the Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel, right? Where human beings became so clever, they decided they were going to ignore God they weren't going to worry about getting to heaven from here. They weren't going to worry about altering their behavior here. What they were going to do instead of having to make a moral choice, they collectivized. All the peoples of the world came together and they built this huge tower that they were going to build so high they could then storm heaven and by force take it from God. This is Dostoevsky at his finest. He's exactly right. If you understand the story of the Tower of Babel, as I just related it, that's exactly it. The socialist argues there is no God and there is no heaven. So we must make this world heaven. We should not worry about moral choices or sacrifice or love or mercy. We should simply choose power here. And by choosing power here, we'll force people at gunpoint to make this a heaven. Right? Whereas in the Tower of, of Babel, it was the same story. We are not happy with this world, but we will not choose God, and we will not choose better moral choices and sacrifice. So we build a tower, we're going to take it. And what God did when he saw the tower being built is he recognized their folly, their materialist folly. And so what he did is he scattered them across the face of the earth and he, he jarbled their languages, right? People started to no longer be able to understand each other because of different, different languages. And what did God do for that presumption? That, Dostoevsky rightly understands, is a great analogous metaphor for what was happening in the, with the socialists of his day. It is rather than trying to get to God from this earth, recognize this material place is not our home, that we get to it by sacrifice and love and other things, we're going to turn this world into a heaven. That's why, as somebody once pointed out, why do, I think it was Thomas Sowell, the great African-American economist, pointed out once, why do the so-called greatest lovers of humanity, the socialists who, who love people way more than the rest of us do, we're told, why do they end up killing so many? Why do they end up murdering so many of the people they say they love? And this is why. Because what they, they think they're offering us a materialist, materialist paradise. And when we don't choose it then, they get offended to the point of killing us. Dostoevsky finished his letter to the M M Moscow Herald by writing, the difference is that our Russian socialists, he said, they are conscious Jesuits and liars who do not admit that their ideal is the ideal of the coercion of human conscience and the reduction of mankind to the level of cattle. That's exactly right. That's why you can kill so many of them. Human beings aren't individual agents whose every precious life matters, made directly in the image of God, no two alike. No, no, no. Human beings are like any other herded hooved beast, right? You harness them, you, you, you prevent them from being born, you cull the herd when there are too many of them. The real point is that these, these Russian these socialists, he said, they are Jesuits. They are equivocators and liars who do not admit that their ideal is the ideal of the coercion of the human conscience and the reduction of mankind to the level of cattle. The question I would like to ask them in a nutshell, Dostoevsky says, is this. Do you despise or do you respect mankind? You who would be its future saviors. Yes, the socialist revolutionary displaces Christ. He is the savior, the Che Guevara, right? The, the, the Stalin, the one who's going to come. And he's going to become the savior of mankind, not by sacrificing himself, not by providing any better world, but by socializing them, commun communizing them, right? Turning them into cattle, taking away the burden of choice and freedom from them. That's exactly right. And speaking of Jesuits, this is exactly what's going on with the Roman Pope right now. The Catholic Church has elected just this kind of dishonest Jesuit to lead the church. This particular Jesuit Pope, the Pope himself, Pope Francis, Francis, think about what he's doing in China. 
Christianity is the fastest growing religion in China, and why wouldn't it be? In a culture like the Chinese culture, where individual choice has been suppressed so long, individual freedoms have been boot thugged for so long, why wouldn't the religion of individuals begin to grow there? And it's taking off in leaps and bounds. So what does this pope do? He makes a bargain with the Chinese government, the Chai Coms, right? The creators of the, the Lao Gai, the Gulag, the place where Muslim Uyghurs are being at in the millions being repressed and put in concentration camps, where religion itself is anathema. This, this crazy Jesuit pope has made a deal with the Chinese government to allow the Chinese government to decide whose bishops are going to be, who's going to lead this church, right? In other words, he has sold out the individuality. And why wouldn't he? Francis is a liberation theology, read socialist prelate from a South American fever swamp, right? The idea that this guy is Christian first is nonsense. Liberation theology is simply social justice applied to theology in the 1960s. It makes perfect sense, right? That he'll allow the brutal communist government to decide who gets to be a bishop. Notice the, 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 the perfidy of this, right? Oh, he's made a bargain with the Chinese that will allow Christianity to survive in China, only it's not Christianity anymore. It's Christianity appropriated to socialist dialectic, right? It is Christianity without Christ. It is Christianity led by the secular state of the Chinese government. Way to go, Francis. Dostoevsky was calling out fake Jesuits like you 150 years ago. If we move a little bit forward, Dostoevsky from the, his novel, 1880, the same time he was writing the newspaper, he was writing his greatest work, The Brothers Karamazov. The book, to my mind, The Brothers Karamazov is the single greatest novel ever written. It is the novel where Dostoevsky lays out the, the greatest reasons why faith was necessary and dis deconstructs the great arguments of all the best atheists of the world. If you want to understand the best atheist arguments, read The Brothers Karamazov. No atheist explained atheism better than Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky did. He just, when he explained it, went through and one by one undercut those arguments one by one. Here's what Dostoevsky says about socialism in the Brothers Karamazov. For socialism is not merely the question of labor or economics. It is, before all things, the atheistic question, the question of the form taken by atheism today, the question of the Tower of Babel built without God, not to mount to heaven from earth but to set up heaven on earth. Brilliantly formulated, much better than even in his letter. And that's exactly what he says, right? Socialism, whatever else you want to call it, and let's be very clear about it, it is first and foremost the atheist question. Socialism is the form that atheism in the modern world takes. Atheism is the problem, primarily because it leads to nothing but materialism, right? The atheist is stuck with only materialism to answer the world's problems, which they've been unable to do in large scale, to deal with the realities of, of life, the, the brevity of it, the finality of it, the biology. Think about it. If you're an atheist, right, how materialistic that is. Biology is everything. There, without biology, there is no life. Life is, by definition, biology. And how does all biological life end? in death, right? Biology, by definition, is a dead end. The minute something lives is the minute it's condemned to die. There is no way out. And he rightly points out, Dostoevsky, that socialism is not a labor question. It is, before all things, the question of belief in God or not. For also from the brother Kar Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky writes, do you know that ages will pass and mankind will proclaim in its wisdom and its science that there is no crime and therefore no sin. That's a Marxist tenet, right? Crime is just a protest against the social order. When criminals do bad things, it's not because the criminal's bad. It's not because the criminal made a bad choice. It's because society is not properly ordered correctly. Tell me this is not the garbage you're hearing from your college campuses. Tell me this is not the, 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 the cant you're hearing from idiots like AOC, right? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's calling for the, uh, the, the elimination of all prisons all throughout America because they're just unhelpful. See, crime is not an individual choice anymore to the Marxist. Crime is a reflection of a social order that's wrong. Dostoevsky said it 150 years ago. Do you know that ages will pass and mankind will proclaim in its wisdom and science that there is no crime and therefore no sin, but there are only hungry people? Feed them first and then demand virtue of them, the atheist will say. And that's exactly where we are.
materialist philosophy. It doesn't matter what else you do. As long as people are fed and as long as people are treated like fed cattle or dairy cows, then that's the most we'll ask of them. And for that privilege of feeding them, we will take all their rights, their liberty, their, their, their individual choices. We will take from them their conscience and their faith. We will make them basically kept pets, kept pets to our, our materialist philosophy. Another quote from the Brothers Karamazov, 1880. Quote, we are not particularly fa- afraid of all of these socialists, anarchists, atheists, and revolutionaries, but there are a few particular men among them who believe in God and are Christians, but at the same time are socialists. Those are the people we are the most afraid of. They are terrible people. The socialist who is a Christian is more to be feared than the socialist who is an atheist, and that's exactly right. The socialist who is a Christian, and you're beginning to see the infection of socialist in all the Christian churches. I've already mentioned that the Catholic Church has completely sold out to this, right? That social justice, which is a godless, materialist, activist form of socialism, has now become a major aspect of the Roman Catholic Church. But don't, don't think it's just Catholicism. Think about the degree to which this kind of social justice posturing has infected all the Christian churches, from the, the low church all the way to the high churches. All of them have been bought into this notion that social justice means dealing with people, not in a, in a primarily spiritual and godly way, but finding out ways to make them materially more comfortable. That's why we never preach about sin anymore. From the any pulpit, we never preach about sin anymore. Anymore. Sin is one of those things that is, if it exists, it is entirely your responsibility, cannot be blamed uh, primarily on the collective or the society. So sin has gone away. Crime has gone away, as Dostoevsky predicted. Crime is just protest, right? When criminals do criminal acts, they're actually heroes who are protesting against an evil social order. And you can how many of the things that Dostoevsky has warned you about have come true. And for education, this is especially dangerous. I've said this many times. These Christians who use Christianity to promote socialism like the Pope does, like many of our secular Protestant churches, uh, many of our Protestant churches do. These clerics and these theologians who argue that social justice is the point of Christianity, a godless materialist focus simply on material needs and wants, that kind of virus that's in, that's, that's, that's in, that kind of virus that's infected our entire church structure, That is the problem. I would rather have my kids go to a public school where I know their faith is going to be under assault from materialists than to send them to Christian schools, which is most of them now, where they're actually not getting Christianity, but where so-called Christian teachers are teaching them anti-Christian values, teaching them a social justice program of materialist thought. This is where we are today. So we've said it many times. It's not even a matter, to the degree that Christianity might be the answer, and it is, it has been the antidote to the poison of socialism going back thousands of years, but in its nascency. The problem is, is that the social justice materialists now who call themselves Christians, who carry the mantle of Christ while secularizing and socializing children to become atheist secularists, those ones are much more dangerous, Dostoevsky says. We Christians don't fear socialism. We should not fear it. But what we should fear is the degree to which Christian institutions of learning, look at, the, look at our Christian colleges. Can you name one? Hillsdale is a secular college. Can you name a serious Christian college that you would send your kids to? Notre Dame? Georgetown? Some of these, would you send them to Baylor? I mean, you think about what's going on in our colleges and the way that social justice has completely transformed Christian education into this kind of secular education.